Let's do it. All right. Well, uh, thank y'all for, excuse me. Thank y'all for tuning in for, did I say the 10th or the 11th? I think this is the 11th episode uh, of Closing Bell. Um, I mean, some crazy stuff has happened in the world this week, uh, which we're going to, I don't know, try to talk about and, and uh, make as much sense of as we can from an economics perspective. Um, as a reminder, um, if you have questions uh, for me or Trey or Chris, who Trey will introduce in a bit, uh, you can type them into the Q&A box there at the bottom. Uh, and we will do our best to answer them. Trey, I want you to take it away, man. Yeah, well, um, this is uh, kind of an, an interesting week. You know, at the beginning of all of this, I think we were, we were originally wondering about what we were going to cover. And, you know, it's probably important to talk through what's been happening since last week, at least on the ag side. Um, so exports really have become, I think, the top story. Um, so what's, what's going on in um, especially Chinese demand. So, uh, so as Chinese demand is ramped up for soybeans, um, as you see, the uh, the sales of Brazilian shipments to China in April and May has has really ramped up. And if you'll notice the trend line there from 1997 to now, it, it shows no sign of slowing down. Um, it looks fairly clear that the, that's going to be a trend that we'll continue to see, especially if if uh, public policy keeps pushing towards more of a uh, cool trade relations between China and the United States. Um, now, while I say that about soybeans, um, there is a counter story going on in pork. Um, so this is um, U.S. pork exports to top five markets in the country. And if you'll notice, um, last year in the first quarter, we, uh, we exported about 100 million pounds to China. Um, in the first quarter this year, we exported 600 million pounds. Uh, to China over the same period of time, and you know this is a this is a pretty massive expansion. Now there there are a couple stories as to why this might truly be the case. You know I think people might want to lean into COVID, but um, the African swine fever is probably a bigger story here. Um, so so that's that's uh, been an important uh, weight on the pork production system in China, which is I think increased demand for pork imports in China. Uh, but but in general, that trend line, again, is, uh, I think, a really positive thing for the pork industry moving forward, expecting to, to see more and more export demand um, for for pork in China, but but as well as many places overseas, including, as, as you can see, Mexico and Japan also saw an increase in pork exports. You're, you're cutting in and out for me, man, but, but I just want to, so you're saying, yeah, there's the, the African swine fever thing, but you're saying that how are you reconciling the huge increase in in pork uh so so there were some there were some regulatory the changes to china and the um there were some regulatory changes that uh that really i think pushed things forward a fair bit um and uh so the i think fsis changed uh some some of the ways that they uh they negotiate with china but but a big story here is, is I think, the, um, a, a decrease in, uh, in production in China. Um, while the, the demand for pork, obviously, in China has remained fairly stable and strong. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, I think, where that goes in the long term. But um, it's, it's something worth monitoring. Uh, you know, not too long ago, we were talking about pork shortages. Uh, and yet, here we are in a, a record spot right now, I'd say, in terms of, of finding new markets for pork, which I think in the long term provides a lot of optimism for that industry. So, but also, part of this dis depends on the phase one trade deal, right? Where right oh. now, we don't know what that is. So, it's hard to be too too full speed ahead on that story until until some of those certainties get unresolved well i think even if even if we don't hit the trade target which i think there's still an interest in in uh, in trade relations between the two countries we'll have to see exactly how that goes yeah. especially coming into november but um that's you know we're at least there is maybe some grounds for optimism and export demand for pork cool um, so also last week, uh, we saw more people filing for unemployment claims. Now that, um, that increase is still a, a shocking number of people relative to the, the regular number of unemployment filings. 
Uh, but it's it's not nearly as terrifying as it was, um, you know, even a, a few short weeks ago. Um, so, you know, these these you know, these filings are, are, we're talking about 43 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits over this pandemic. I mean, that is, that is shocking when you think about a country that has 330 million people total. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at more than, you know, what, almost 15% of Americans filing for unemployment in one period of time. That's crazy. Is that what it was? I thought that the, I thought that it was, the unemployment rate was 20% or 19.7 in May. So the unemployment rate, um, is is kind of a it's a complicated thing to, to unpack. I know, but it's a better um, measure than the thing that you were talking where you were throwing babies into that. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm talking about filings. So, in in the unemployment rate and unemployment filings aren't exactly the same thing either. So, um, so we're talking about just the people who have filed for unemployment in the last two months, um, and that's a that's a shocking 43 million number, uh, which is pretty incredible. Now, again, you do have to keep in mind that uh, especially the way that we've count unemployment, um, you know, women have been disproportionately affected, um, uh, which has led to, I, I think, a lot of uh, uh, incivil inequality, I would say, between the two genders, um, especially as it relates to child care, which many child care facilities are not open now, um, which, again, places a lot of big questions as to how you start bringing people back into the marketplace for, for jobs when, uh, when somebody needs to take care of their kids and school's out. So, um, you know, trying to find a way to thread this needle is, is uh, still a concern. I do. So on the childcare front, I think some of those places, at least in Michigan are opening back up. So we're getting back, we're getting back to it, but we're not, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Exactly. It'll be interesting to see um, the extent of that persists, but, but it's, uh, some of that story's changing. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of starts getting me into thinking about, um, some of the bigger questions here that I, I think, I, I think has led to a lot of the civil unrest in the United States right now. Um, at, at least as of the why, why now conversation where, where, you know, police injustice has been a conversation for many, many years. What, what is it about this moment? Well, coronavirus has been disproportionately bad for certain parts of the American population. Um, and uh, so the first one that pops out, especially here in Michigan, is the urban centers of the United States are the places that tend to have the highest, un or the highest coronavirus cases. Um, that and obviously uh, meatpacking facilities and communities. Yakima County has the highest rates in uh, on the West Coast. Yakima County is where we grow a lot of the produce that we eat. Um, most of the hops, for example, in the United States are grown there. Um, now, when we start talking about how this has disproportionately affected different parts of the population, uh, one of the first things that really comes to mind for me is is working from home. You know, a lot of people want to say that, you know, they, they don't have some type of privilege or there's, there's nothing that, that really that they've kind of built themselves, et cetera. And that's, that's, a, that's an important, I think, component of the American zeitgeist, at least historically. Um, but, but what it obfuscates is this. So working from home is, uh, is really just for top earners. So in the, in the bottom quartile, or so the bottom 25% of people in the United States who are working, only 9% of them are actually capable of working from home. So 91% so of the people who make the, le the least amount of money didn't even have a chance going into this. You know, this, this stay at home stuff and not don't go to work. Well, guess what? That's not a choice for a lot of people. Um, and, and so that conversation, I think, is, is at least part of the reason that, that we're seeing so much frustration um, in, in the data that we're, that's coming out, et cetera. I do. You have to be a little bit careful there because because an additional thing that that's also happening right here that that we're not capturing is the essentialness of workers and the income uh, sure. distribution there. Where I don't have numbers on that, but my guess is that it would be really striated between the kind of top half and the bottom half. Well, the irony is, right, that the bottom half tend to be the essential workers. Um, and so, so how is it that people that are, are making the least are also the same people who are designated essential and, and uh, basically having to shoulder some of this burden associated with COVID risk? Mm. Um, you know, it, it is a very interesting system when, when you really start placing these pieces in public policy. Um, now, I, 
that being said, there are a lot, obviously a lot of things that kind of coming from the privileged place that I, I think you and I have, have, uh, have lived over our lives. Uh, you know, we, we just can't fundamentally can't understand what's going on. Yeah. So the, the big thing that I think is, is on everybody's mind right now, for as much as we want to talk about coronavirus, et cetera, that's second page news now. What is the number one thing I think everybody is very much concerned about is what's going on right here, right now, about racial injustice in the United States. Um, and, and this is something that, that I, I want to be clear on the front end that, that at Michigan State University, um, you know, in AFRI, in the College of Agriculture, we are very much against any type of racial discrimination, no matter how it might rise its ugly head. Um, you know, MSU, the College of Ag, is actually – implemented an Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, we've spent a, a fair amount of time trying to take steps in the right direction, but it's important to remember that they are just steps. Uh, this, is, this is a process. Um, and, and in that process, this is the thing that's really been in the news the most. Um, so the, the photo on the left is, uh, is from a protest that was led by Terrence Floyd, which was the brother of the deceased George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd, of course, was was uh, um, the man that was was violently murdered in Minneapolis. Um, that, uh, that I think sparked a lot of the the frustration, uh, and it's it's kind of led to uh, some of this uh, this uh, this massive movement across the United States. Uh, and then I also wanted to put up photos from the other day here in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, so these are photos from literally uh, four blocks from where I'm sitting right now. Um, you know, Lansing, Michigan is not a big place. Uh, and yet, and yet, we're still seeing civil unrest, and we're seeing a lot of conversations that that I, I think were overdue and needed to happen. Um, so that started us down this conversation, Alex and I, about how are we going to deal with that this week? How are we going to? How are we going to, at some level, maybe try to make a contribution? Um, you know, and and at some point, we kind of realized that I mean, there's not really much. That you and I <laughs> personally can do, um, you know, so I, I started thinking more and more about kind of what this looks like. Um, the, so here's some data that I think is very interesting. So uh, this is from 538. So this is um, number of people killed by police in urban, suburban and rural zip codes from 2013 to 2019. So if you'll notice, there's a decrease in the number of people who are killed in, uh, in urban places. Uh, now, if you look at the suburb and, and rural places, there's actually been a pretty significant increase, um, which is, uh, I think, a very interesting conversation, that the, the changes in suburban and rural um, killings has actually masked this decrease in urban places, actually. Um, so thinking from that data perspective, um, I, we, we kind of had this conversation and we realized that, you know, in our own lives, there are people who have been disproportionately affected by these these issues um and so this is a book that uh that chris my brother-in-law gave me a couple years ago um and it honestly was probably one of the first times i ever read or or really digested um an african-american man's story of living in the united states um you know i, I grew up in a really rural place or a really a, a very white place um that we just didn't have that conversation um so what thankfully um, we I reached out to Chris and and Chris thankfully um, agreed to come talk to us just about his own experiences. Um, now Chris, like I said, is is uh, he's my brother-in-law. Chris has done a, a million things that I think he's going to talk about a little bit. But uh, this is these are my two nieces, uh, and uh, and then here is Chris actually giving a talk at Texas Tech where he got his master's in social work. Uh, Chris now lives in California, but um, for years he lived in uh in oklahoma he lived in alabama he lived in texas uh, and so so i asked him if he would come and, and kind of talk us through what it's like living in a rural agricultural community as a black man uh so thanks for joining us chris we really appreciate having you here hey thank you for um thank you for the time i really want to say thank you to the both of you guys for just having me on here um this is uh i just think it's a conversation that is just uh, it just needs to be had more now. And you're starting to see more people want to talk about it. I feel like it's all over the news. And um, I'm just happy to see people kind of come together and just start this dialogue. Well, okay, so we're going to get here. But I want to point out to everybody that's watching real quick, 
we're all we have all at, at at the same point lived within like a couple hours of each other okay so uh one of the stars is garden city uh which is where schaefer went to high school um the another star is valley center kansas which is where i went to high school uh alex played football at friends um and and uh my family and chris actually met my sister in alva oklahoma uh alva doesn't even it's not even big enough to get on the map uh so it's um it's it's a small town um and and that's where you met natalie but but let's take a step back before we get too far down the road can you kind of talk us through how you ended up there, what it was like growing up, and, and just tell us your life story if you could. Yeah. Um, uh, man, I don't know where to start. I was, uh, I guess, starting off, so I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Um, and growing up in Los Angeles, um, my parents kind of would take my brother and I, and they would send us to schools kind of outside of our district because we were in Compton, so we went to a private school in Hawthorne, and we couldn't afford it anymore, so then we went to a public school, and I remember that jump uh, from that private to that public, it was like instant, like, whoa, you know, like, and um, I just remember the kids, that they, they were so much, um, they were so much faster than I was, as far as uh, just wit, like they were, um, everything was quicker and I had to catch on quick. Otherwise you got bullied. Um, from there, we would go on to another private school and then I went to another school and they found out I lived outside the district. So we said, we can't go to that school. So, um, eventually we ended up moving to Riverside, California, which is where I'm at now. It's kind of a suburb outside of Los Angeles. And, um, that was a transition. I went from every school I had been to, it, it might've been three or four white, people at the school and then you switch over and you're like oh it's she was on the opposite foot now um uh so I played ball went to school in alabama which was very rural tuskegee um and some of you guys know about the issue of tuskegee like the tuskegee airmen and they talk about the tuskegee syphilis experiment and that was a. Uh, I think that was my first taste of rural living like oh wow the the pace was a lot slower than what i was used to um i had never been in the country before you know and this was in the south um so i leave tuskegee move back home because i'm like yo this is just not for me i just can't do this country stuff um and then i just started working so i worked at like a costco i worked at a sears I think I worked at um, a Target. And after doing those jobs, I realized, okay, I gotta get back into school because this definitely, if this is not the road. Um, so I got back into school and the way that I got into school was I was like, well, school's expensive, but I used to play football and that's kind of been this thing I can do. So maybe I can go find a place that'll take me um, that I can play football. Um, but by this time I was about 21. And oh, really? Mm -hmm. So you have two choices where you can walk on to a program and after you walk on, it's kind of like a uh, audition, I guess. You, you go out there, you, they show them that you can play and then afterwards they say, okay, we're, we're going to give you this much. Or you can do what I did where I went to a junior college and you go walk on there, but it's not as expensive and you're able to get some film together now. So you, you play in the games, they record you. And then you can ship this film out to schools. And that is a one way for you to get into a college. Um, that was so hard when I went to that junior college. I had been out of football for several years. And you know, when you, when you get out of high school and then you jump out of college and you're working, no money feels like money to you because it's the first time that you've had a job and you're, you're making money, but you're living with your parents. I eventually moved out, but I was basically living the young 21, 22 party lifestyle. And then I go, well, I'm going to go jump and play this football, thinking that I could just do it like that. Mm -hmm. And I was, oh, it was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. It was like a four month period of waking up at five in the morning. I was going to work. I was working at this children's center. Um, and then I would be there till about... 
oh man, 5.30 I wake up, get there at six, I'm there from six to maybe two, then I'd hop on the freeway and drive like 45 minutes to San Jacinto, eat on the way there, and then I get there around three o'clock, and then we have practice from about 3.30 to about 5.30, maybe six. You get out of there, drive home, then you get home, you eat, you study, um, plays, you got it, because you got to catch up. They got guys who are there. They, some guys redshirted at the junior college. So you got guys that have been just their third year. And this is like, it's now or never for them. And you're competing with them as a first year person. And some of them are fresh out of high school, and some of them are, are bounce backs who have gone to universities and it didn't work out, or they were good enough to play at the university, but they didn't have the SATs or the ACTs. So they say, hey, go to this junior college because then they can keep an eye on you there and then just play a year and then come on down here and transfer. And so and so the junior college was where? Mount San Jacinto. This is like in the desert. of in California. Um, yeah, it's very hot. Um, it's kind of rural too out there if you want to count it as rural. Yeah. Um, but uh, so playing so then, there. And, then from there, you, you moved to Alabama. Is that right? Nope. From no. there, that's where I came to Alabama. Oh. Mm -hmm. ah, okay put some film together somebody uh, uh i had a couple schools recruiting me and i was kind of like i got humbled i guess you can say where i was like oh, i'm not going there i'm not going then the schools were like if you ain't coming then we're not calling so then you're <laughs> like oops okay uh who, who i'll go wait, wait who's gonna take me you know mm -hmm. and um so i get to Alba, and oh my goodness i was so unprepared for Alba. like for one just the weather okay. uh, I, <laughs> Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. I, I had never been in like snow. Like in California, we would have snow. You go to Big Bear, but it's like, oh, it's fun. I had never been in like, you no, know, you have to shovel yourself out snow, you know, and um, you would hate didn't have to shoot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you think Alva is cold, you, I don't know how you feel about Michigan. Oh my goodness. So, I, I can't even imagine. Okay. So, so you moved to Alva and, uh, did you know anybody in Alva? Uh, actually, no. I had I got there and it was the one guy that I knew, but I didn't even know he was going to be there. A friend of mine named Justin. I literally got to Alva. We got in really late, and you know that drive from the airport to Alva, it's just flat. So you got a lot of time to kind of think. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I remember I got in, and it's nothing. And um, I just met one guy there. And for that first probably six months, we, we just really stuck together as far as uh, like, okay, I know you, you know me, and the rest we just got to figure out. So, it, Can you talk about that, the rest, like how the change? So you said you've been in places before where it was predominantly uh, white, white kids, uh, my guess is, I mean, you haven't said it explicitly yet, but my guess is that's what your experience was in Alva. How was that different maybe than California or Tuskegee? I think it was different because these were, um, like I had been around white kids in California, but when you got to Alva, it was Southern white kids. And um, it kind of made me think, I know Trace showed that statistic earlier about how the, the rural shootings I think you said they have stayed the same while uh, those in the have cities have decreased. Yeah, have increased. And I thought about, I wonder if that says anything about the culture of the areas. And, um, mm -hmm. a different way of, uh, they look at it like, uh, I know when I was in Alva and just being in there, and I, I did social work down there too, I worked at CPS. And the, um, first I wanna say the people down there doing those kind of jobs, amazing people, um, I just, I learned so much from all of them. And even in Alva, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about um, just that small town, looking out for each other kind of vibe. Now, I think that that is my experience of how certain people may have put their arms around me. Uh, but I've also felt the, the other side of it where it's a little bit like, um, this is the way we do things here. and you can either get on board or get out of here kind of kind of feeling. Um, so I think that is in large part to the people you meet. Um, so, okay, so 
when I when I think about Alva, or when I think about um, like Laverne, Oklahoma, uh, I mean it. There's a lot of people who look almost identical and are all related to each other, or at least they know each other's families. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and and that's I, I get. I think you know even being an outsider would be hard. Um, but did you ever feel like like you were the first? black person that people engaged with or had ever really talked oh, to or oh most definitely yeah most definitely yes yes and not just the first black person but also you take into account i'm not from a place yeah. like georgia or um i'm from california so that was already a little di- different because it's a southern school so you get a lot of people from the south that sometimes go to the southern schools or, or from oklahoma and then I had been in a places where, um, like I said earlier, like I had gone to school where there was only like four white people. And then I had gone to school where there was like, um, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 black people. But the graduating class would be like 500 people. You know what I mean? So um, so what, it, what were some things that like, so, so we were talking the other day and I, like I've never seen a band-aid that wasn't for a Caucasian person. Yeah. Um, like yeah. what things like, like what are things that like, like people don't even like think to not know, like what are the unknown unknowns? Cause like, like to me, oh, I think, I, I guess the first thing that I think of when you say that is probably the hair. Yeah. The dreadlocks. Yeah. Um, I think that sometimes people associate dreadlocks with like, some pretty negative connotations behind them. Um, and I, I think that um, that is one, that is the first thing that I think that dropped into my mind and that I, I noticed when I would go places when they would see somebody with dreadlocks, it, you would see a response. You know what I mean? Like, um, or um, shoot, man. Uh, that, that, that probably was one of the first things I noticed. Another thing would probably be um, like we were talking about earlier about taking into account sometimes um, the background of some of the uh, the coaches. Like I was telling you the story about the guy who he would when he would talk to the coach, his, his southern accent would get heavier, and he would say he would say like yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. You know, and, and I'm like, man, why do you talk like that? You know what I mean? And he would say, man, it's just a game, and I'm just trying to get ahead. And um, I felt like having to do things like that, um, you're having to weigh out your pride um, over what you feel is best for you and your family. And um, in, in any situation, even now, you do that a lot. You do that when you are the minority and the majority looks a little different and um, they grew up a little different. Their beliefs might be a little different from yours. And, you know, it's not just sit at our desk and just work all day. Like, and I'm saying this when things were normal when we weren't working from home. When, you were, when you're at work, you, you interact with your colleagues. You guys talk about things. There's a culture built within the office. And... Um, you as the odd man in a lot of situations are like, man, I don't agree with that, but I'm going to need this person for this down the road. How do I go about um, maintaining that distance? Or um, if, if someone says something that you're like, that's offensive to me, I don't, I don't like that. And how to tell that person, hey, that's offensive to me. And that person feeling like, they're offended that you brought it up to them yeah. or yeah. feeling like, Oh, you're being overly sensitive. You know what I mean? Um, Which well, sounds like a so, lot of strategy. <laughs> it's a lot of microaggressions, man. It, it, it's, I, it's a lot of microaggressions. Yeah. Chris, you were, you were telling me a couple of different stories when we were talking earlier and I, you gotta, you gotta tell me if I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but you, you told me, or you just shared the story of your, um, friend who almost went like stereotype or caricature the 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 southern yes sir thing. 
Yeah. Uh, but then you also, I think, were telling me earlier about how you sort of adapt to take on or, or you like you're doing your best white guy impression. Uh, and I wonder what those strategies, the difference okay, of those I strategies. Guess. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Um, I will say there's no white guy impression. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, uh, and, and I, I'm glad that we're having the conversation because these are the, um, the things that I put it on my Instagram the other day. I'm like, we need to keep having these talks because as we work through the mud, there's going to be things where people are like, oh, oh, oh. And it's like, well, how would I know if I've never interacted? And how would they know if they've never interacted before, for us to even get to that place of like, oh, oh, I didn't know, you know. So um, I think what the white guy thing we was referring to was about, I was making a joke about one of my friends about his customer service voice. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I was saying how um, when he would get on the line and pick up the phone and um, call me from, I would call him on his work phone and his voice would sound completely different than when I called him on it. Like from his tone to his accent, it just, I said, man, you sound so gentle, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, I feel like there's a, a fine line between customer service and crossing over if you get what i'm saying i don't i don't quite get what you're saying are, are okay. you uh are you saying crossing over in terms of because in my mind it's still this adopting the the white cultural persona but are you saying the that other is what way? i mean by crossover? okay okay cool yeah, okay. that's what i mean by crossover the white cultural persona that is a perfect way to describe it as opposed to you just being yourself and providing great customer service or um so i i felt like when i would when i would talk to him and i would call him he'd get upset but he felt like this is what they want this is how they want us to talk on these phones because the other person on the phone uh, i don't know sometimes there's a certain association when they hear their voice like that and of course um he's just trying to get his bills paid you know so he's kind of in that situation where he might not like it but he's like what am I going to do? They got me this script and I'm going to read it. Mm. So, um, so can I ask you, we've got a couple questions. You've actually got a lot of questions here, but uh, I wonder if you could, uh, someone just says whether you could compare your um, experiences in urban America or the cities versus rural uh, and, and how it felt different being a minority in the rural area versus and by rural. someone he means natalie uh so <laughs> my sister. Okay. are you guys cheating um, you've got preloaded questions yeah <laughs> so um, well, that's like, not even fair we're, 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 <laughs> above board here this is my sister asking i didn't know that uh, so the the first question is chris do you feel systemic racism is deeper rooted in rural america versus the city and was it different for you as a minority I just saw the question now. That is hilarious. <laughs> um, I feel like it's deeper rooted in rural America versus the city. Um, I feel like in rural America, there's so much room for um, no, like no one will care. Like you can get away with things and do things, and they have a way of doing it. And it's like, this is our town or this is our city and this is the way we handle things. And that's it. Or I feel like in the city, you have um, a couple of more places you can get your voice out and be heard. So you can kind of like, well, if they didn't do it like this here, I, I know I can go here. Or in this area, I have more people that might look like me. And then um, in my experiences, you also have them to where like, oh, there's a black district attorney or there's a, a black judge over here or, or a hispanic or just different cultures that provide different perspectives that might understand better where you're coming from um, and so natalie just alley-ooped you into your your next question here which was for these white guys in rural america how do we seek out those opportunities to be culturally competent that is hilarious 
<laughs> she's just she's just feeding you, man. <laughs> I see. I'm, I just look like, oh, I gotta send her a text. <laughs> um, I would say just stuff like this. Honestly, you gotta go where you can find it. I, I think it's difficult, especially in rural areas. Um, not just because first of all, you have you gotta meet them, you know, and then second of all, it takes time to get to know someone intimately enough where they're gonna share things with you, and then you have to just listen. Because I feel like a lot of times people are quick to discredit the feelings of other people. When when a person tells you how they feel and then you're going to tell them how they should feel. And it's like, I'm only sharing with you my experience and what it feels like coming from my place. And I feel like a lot of times when we hear that, we're quick to tell people, no, that's not right. Or no, that's, and I'm like, that, he's not going to lie to you about how he feels. You know what I mean? So, um, so I think something like this is good, uh, even if it's on a, a small scale, you know, whoever sees it might might hear this conversation and say, oh, I, I might gain something from it. So um, but other than that, I would just say. Um, I don't want to say, like, seek them out, but I, I just say just stay open, stay open minded, um, watch where you're getting your information from. Um, read. That's a really big one reading I, yeah. I know that book trey talked about that he really liked so so I just i was just going to throw out some numbers so I'm, I'm reading another book i read as much as i can but and this this is something i just don't honestly like i i, I it's it's tragic how little i know about this topic um you know i mean i've read a fair amount but obviously i, I can't there's nothing i can do to like check my bias on this perfectly and so, so I'm reading this book, White Fragility, right now. And uh, so they're talking about just different percentages of the population as of 2017. The, the 10 richest Americans are 100% white. Uh, U.S. Congress is 90% white. U.S. governors are 96% white. Um, teachers are 82% white. Um, Full-time college professors are 84% white. Um, and so I, I, was, I was looking at these numbers earlier. Uh, number, uh, percent of... Uh, NFL um, owners, 97% white. Um, and, uh, and so like the teacher one really struck me because I started sitting back and thinking about it. And I don't know if I've ever had a non-white teacher um, or in like kindergarten to eighth grade. I don't know if I did. Um, honestly, I, I mean, ninth to 12th grade I did. Uh, but, but like, you know, if I, if I really sit back and think about it, it's like, wow, like, like there, there are these like institutional differences that, that like, I, I've just never really thought about, um, you know, and we were talking and, about that earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but about no, like, no, go for it. The football, um, the coaches. Yeah. And we were talking about like diversity hires and yeah, you honestly always want, you know, whoever is the best guy for the job gets the job. Um, and I felt like that shows up more so on the field with players than it does so in upper level management and in coaching. Hmm. So when you have best guy gets the job, it's like, man, I can run better. I can move better. I can do these things. I know the playbook better. It's just a bunch of different things that prove that you just beat the guy, you know? And then when you get into the area, when we talk about coaching and it's not about best guy gets the job. It's, it's who you know and who, who wants to give you the shot or the opportunity. Because if you got a guy who's been playing football his entire life, study football his entire life, that guy knows football, you know, mm -hmm. and, and has had the training, been around the coaches, um, just knows the game but can't get a head coaching job. You know, and I don't, I don't think that it's like, well, he didn't, he didn't get it just because – the other guy was better. I'm like, I can't believe that that is the way it is done every time. And it's like that 96, what was it, 96%? Uh, football, of NFL coaches like or NFL yeah. owners, 97. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's like, um, no, no, something's wrong there. That, that is, it's, it's not the best guy getting the job there, you know. Chris, can I ask you a question going back to the, suppose I'm, dumb Alex living in, in rural America. And the question is, what do we do? Um, what do we do to make ourselves better and to make society better? 
uh, which are big questions. Uh, and I, I just worry about the simple answer of uh, seek friends out. Because I know um, I don't have a lot of experience with with black people, but I know that a lot of people, uh, foreigners who have come to the U.S., uh, feel like it's a really two-faced thing, where um, their perspective is that that uh, basically these white rural people are like collecting treasures, like you're you're now my token black friend. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Which oh, isn't yeah. which isn't a traditional. Mm -hmm. That's not a real friendship. And so if we have these different cultures to where the, rea the real friendship thing isn't an easy thing to do, I think the, the having a token black friend may be counterproductive in terms of building that relationship. I, I, I think you're right. And um, the whole token thing, um, I think you're right. I think people do do that. I, I, I think it dehumanizes them. Like you don't see them as a, a human being, especially not on an equal level. You see it as like a token, like, oh, this check, I got him, I got me one here. So let me go ahead and make this post real quick so he can see it. <laughs> there so you cool, go. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, but I, I mean, isn't there something to this though that like, um, like, when I think about like, like I, th I think if I had stayed where I grew up, I could have lived mm -hmm. my whole life with my exposure to black culture being like, well, like we were talking about the other day, like the NBA and you know, uh, some TV shows maybe. Um, like, yeah, I whatever. Mean, it, information. It, you, you almost have to go into some uncomfortable conversations before you can really make that friendship. And you know, I, yeah, I, I just, uh, I, 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 don't, I just don't know right the answer, the you know? I think the, the uncomfortable conversations definitely have to happen. Um, the, the, the reading, when I was saying, like, well, maybe you can just read, like, that book. Um, you, and it's nothing to do with Google search and find you some books to read, you know? Sure. And I'm not saying that's the answer, but I'm saying it's a start. And um, for me, and I'm, I'm just speaking from my own personal experiences, when I've kind of had those moments of like getting to know someone of a different race or culture. And when I say different race, it can be anything, but I'll just keep it for the sake of like you and I, a black person and a white person, yep. you try to get to know who they are and their character before you open up intimately to this person. So it's like, otherwise we're just going to, we're going to talk, we're going to see each other, but we're always going to have this little wall in place mm. that um, we never go past. And um, we'll just manage the relationship from there. I think right now, a lot of those walls are, I don't know if I want to say being tore down, but they're definitely being peeked over. Like people are starting to go, okay, now I want to know this yeah. person at a deeper level. I, I, and I want to know what this person's experience is like. So when, when they're saying these things or they're outraged by something, I want to know where is it coming from? And being able to just listen you know, um, I feel like a lot of times um, people hear you to respond, you know, like they're, they're not, I'm listening, but I'm not taking anything in. I'm just listening to you and getting ready to give you, nope, 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 nope. You know, as to um, how you feel about a situation. And um, then, you know, we can pull up numbers and statistics and, um, Honestly, man, I feel like you just got to get to know people intimately because everybody will pull up their own numbers and their own statistics. And a lot of times those stats are biased and they'll try to find ways to flip it, to hold their stance on their argument. But I feel like you got to do a lot of intrinsic work to really ask yourself questions like, am I racist? What, 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 what comes to mind when I do like really hard? Dude, that's, the, that's the freaking problem for me is I don't realize it when I'm being racist. You know what I mean? It's the it's the blindness rather than, or, and maybe it's willful ignorance, but but it's just a huge amount of blindness, I think. Well, so like on this book, this is what I it was an emotional book. It was, I mean, that there was a little bit of like, because I, I read I read like economics, you know, where it's mm -hmm. like a, like there's no emotion in it, or if there is, it's kind of hidden in other stuff. Where this was yeah. just his experiences. You know, um, yeah. 
and like, so here are a couple other books that like I, I have been helpful to me, but, um, but again, so, so, uh, especially the middle one, the color of law, that's, it's a fantastic book about the history of institutional racism in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it really does very clearly articulate how government programs have been passed over the last 100, 150 years to, to kind of facilitate this racism to like perpetuate it through public policy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but, but the emotions that come through in like the Malcolm X, X autobiography or this white fragility book is, it's just a different conversation. Um, but, but again, like reading this stuff, it's helpful, but like, I don't know. I, I it's not going to tell me how somebody's feeling. Yeah. Well, but maybe we should ask Chris about that. What Are there think? books that you think give a good perspective of what it's like to be a black man in America? Give a good pers Oh, well, the one by Tanaji Coates was a great one. Okay. Um, between the world, one. yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. That that is that one nails it pretty good. <laughs> he he kind of hits it. Um, well, he talks in the book. He talks about his. They're either his future children or his current children. Um, but the the conversation is about like like what would I tell my kids. You know, yeah. and, and so like, I think, like, I remember talking to, to my sister even about like, 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 what does this world look like for children? You know, yeah. and, and I, I think, like, like, when I start thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the protests that are going on in Lansing and in everywhere else, you know, I, there is, I think, always this undertone of like, what, we want to leave this world better for our kids. Um, I mean, it, it, what, what do you think of, of kind of the, the future, I guess? <laughs> Um, uh, do you, do you, do you think optimistic. that there's promise here? Do you think that we're seeing change or? I try to be optimistic. I think that there have been changes. I think change is slow. Um, I feel like um, in so many ways, I believe so wholeheartedly that we can all get along. Um, that I believe that so strong you could see it in the woman I chose to marry. You know, like, I, I believe that um, at the core, we're damn near all the same, man. Um, when you And to get past those layers and get to see another human being when you look at somebody rather than the differences, um, I think that um, that is where the change starts to happen. Like, this person gets sad just like me. This person gets stressed like I do. This person is having to deal with just the woes and troubles of life that all of us have to deal with as we go along the way and enjoy those happy times and those happy moments. And I don't want to make that journey harder for them. Um, so I want to make sure that whatever it is I'm doing, I'm not trying to make it harder for anybody else while I'm here. And hopefully I can make things better. Um, so I, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Um, and, and I feel like conversations like, cause you gotta think, man, we were, uh, it hasn't been that long. You know what I mean? And um, change is slow, but it's happening. So I feel optimistic about it. So, I mean, I, I think, so somebody made the comment that, you know, that it's, it's not just, uh, um, you know, there, there are so many racial tensions in the United States that are deeply embedded in, in just like the history of the founding of the country. Um, you know, so um, he, he points out uh, that uh, the natives have the highest rate of police based deaths. And um, that's, uh, I think it's a very interesting point. Um, so there's another great book. Um, so this is the other slavery. This is another really famous book that came out about that topic. Um, the, uh, the one that really changed my perspective on, on that one is a book called uh, In the Spirit of Crazy Horse by Peter Mathiasen, uh, where mm -hmm. he talks about how, again, this institutional racism, we, we want to think that like wounded knee was when we quit being mean to natives, you know, mm -hmm. but, but like, I mean, for the entire 20th century and, and into the 21st century, there have been, you know, time after time where, where these treaties and these established norms were, uh, were violated. Um, and, and so it's, it's a, it's a conversation um, that, that I, I think it, it transcends 
you know, just just white versus black. I mean, it, it, there's just a spectrum of this conversation that I, I just don't know if we've had it well enough. Um, and, and maybe it's just that we're scared of it. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. This is, this is a scary conversation for me. Um, I, I appreciate the, the um, and this is what we talked about earlier about um, being open because now you're vulnerable because now you're, you know, if, if I say something that's ignorant, I just shared it to everybody on here to let them know that I was ignorant about a topic. And, but I have the, my fear of looking ignorant does not overshadow the courage I have to want to get past my ignorance. So I'm willing to look like a fool at times, if that's how I come off, in order to make progress and move forward, you know? And it ensures that I won't look like a fool again. You know what I mean? Because now that they've got that fixed, it's like I'm not going backwards. So, so when you think about um, like living in Alva and living in Lubbock, and and you know, the the folks that you interacted with, who maybe you were the first person they ever met who didn't grow up in Alva, or or didn't grow up in the Panhandle, um, what would you tell them to? try to get them to engage or what advice would you give them to engage in, in a movement that for them just feels like a city thing or feels like a thing that isn't in, in the panhandle or feels like, well, you know, I live in the upper peninsula, you know, this is a, this is a conversation for the folks down in the lower peninsula, you know, or whatever it is, where, where do they come down in a way that, that can be beneficial or productive? Um, that's a tough question. It's a big uh, ask. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a very tough <laughs> I know. I, you it, just it, ask Chris to solve all of the problems in one well, sentence. How, how do you connect <laughs> these folks? You know, um, I, you know, you think about like the, so, have you ever seen the social network maps of uh, the country and how like, like people don't really engage with people even outside of their own states. Um, we like I, I think we earlier, have these insulated uh, communities. About we were joking earlier about the Instagram algorithm, like what I get on my feed versus what my yeah. wife gets on her feed, you know? Um, but uh, honestly, the, the first thing I would say is kind of, we went back to it earlier, just read. I think that's a great book to start with. And, it, and he was very open and honest about how he felt about his lived experiences. And a lot of those are related to. So I would say that that is a great read and it gives you a, like, okay, it kind of is a good start. And I'm not going to say I related to everything he said, um, but I did relate to a lot of it. So, Reading. Um, so we got another question that's kind of, I think, along that line uh, from Macy. Um, but uh, oh, the, this is just the Malone family reunion live. <laughs> There are like 90 of us, so it might actually just be everybody watching. Is <laughs> something about being Irish Catholic? Hey, that's the point right there. Members. That is support. Right uh, there. So, <laughs> so, uh, so Maisie asks. I also lived in Alva. I had friends and friends of friends who always seemed targeted by police in our areas based on race. Uh, too many cops were pulling a car full of black college students over for small, meaningless infractions. We saw the data showing that there are more killings and rural and suburban America, but did you notice a difference in policing between urban and rural areas? Um, like personally. Policing in urban and rural areas? Um, oh man, I wish I had my cousin Eric here. Um, I do not get to, uh, I think it's a little different in the, in the rural areas because it's small towns. Everybody knows everybody. Um, so it's like, um, you might know, you know, Joe Blow and be like, Joe Blow is an asshole. I know that for a fact as a person, Joe Blow is an asshole, but Joe is also the sheriff. Mm. Boom. You know what I mean? So it's yep. like, and, um, what you going to do about it, you know? And, and, uh, the, the urban areas, I think, you know, you got a lot of, depending on what urban area you go to, you got more of the gang culture than I guess you see in some of those rural areas. Um, so the policing is a little bit, uh. I think they get jaded, man. I feel like they come in, um, the job is already very traumatic. Some of them are not, they're not properly trained. They have no cultural competence and it becomes more of a, a power thing than a, um, 
I want to make sure people are safe and um, mm -hmm. it just becomes, I want you to know where you stand. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like when she talked about those guys being pulled over in that car and um, being just harassed, they did that to show them they could do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, don't let one of the kids get emotional or, or um, just, you know, it, it's power, it's power. Well, we're about out of time, Chris. I wanted to give you kind of the last cut. It, you know, if there's anything else you'd want to say, um, you know. You're going to make him it. sum it up again. You, he has to save the world again. I, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I got nothing. I, I, I mean, you know, like, I, I'm try, we're trying to do the right thing, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's important to, to at least create some platforms for, for people of color. Um, and, and I, you know, I hope we're taking these, these conversations in the right direction um, or at least I opening the door the for people to have man. conversations. And, yeah. and I, I, I would just like to, to give you the chance to give that final cut. Honestly, man, I just appreciate the effort on both of you guys. Uh, with Michigan, I know this is completely out of left field from what the podcast is usually about. Um, but just to say, but when you turn on the news or just see what's going on in the world, it's hard to ignore this. So to just take some time out of, I guess, your regularly scheduled programming to go, well, we're going to address this today. And hopefully it can um, reach the ears of some people who can say, you know, I never looked at it like that on a lot of things and start to maybe change some things about themselves. And then, you know, if they make those changes, then they just trickle down into everything. It'll, it'll change the way that they raise their kids. It'll change the way that they may approach um, situations that they might have thought, oh, well, you know, these people, and then they, well, no, because now I know those people, and I know what those people go through, so I have an understanding of where those people are coming from. So I, I think that um, the interaction, the uncomfortable conversations are a great start to get us moving in the right direction. So I really want to say thank you guys for having me on here. Well, thanks for your awesome, Chris. Man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so yeah. much, dude. Awesome. Well, I think that concludes it. Thank yeah. you, everybody, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Awesome, man. You guys take care.